faster and with more volume than ever before. And those who are not prepared to keep up will fall behind. And so school teaches you what to learn. Mm. I show people how to learn it. Ah, so here's the thing, but school doesn't really teach all the lessons we need, do they? <laughs> That's for sure. If you think about it, you know, how many times has a teacher or a parent wagged their finger at you and said, pay attention when I'm talking to you, right. listen up. And yet almost nobody has ever taken any formal classes in how do you become a better listener? How are you, how do you become a more attentive listener? Or how do you focus? Now, because you are an expert in the field of Chinese martial arts, you're all about focus and concentration. Yeah. So unless somebody's in yoga mm -hmm. or martial arts, they have almost no training in how to develop the powers of concentration at all. And yet we all know that that's really important stuff. And so I get into a lot of the practical how to with the learning process. And I'll we'll cover more about that in a moment. Yeah. So when we think about we learn something, the problem that a lot of people have is retaining, right? So retaining is such a difficult thing for people because first, maybe, and you talked about it a second ago, they didn't listen intently. They didn't listen with both ears because a lot of times people talk and they get interrupted by somebody who really wasn't listening because they wanted to input their knowledge or their words in. So they never heard what you were saying, right? Tell me how important it is. And you talked about it in order to remember how important it is to listen. Well, listening is a master skill. Mm. And since so many of your viewers and listeners are in business and many of them are parents as well. Right. You know, we've all had the experience of talking to our kids or our kids talking to us and getting accused. You never listen to me. You know, no marriage counselor ever heard my spouse listens to me too much. <laughs> <laughs> never. And we see this in business a lot as well. And so many times people are merely quiet while they're thinking about how they're going to respond. And you said something really important uh, a moment ago in terms of the process of learning where you're talking about recall. Right. Well, recall is the last part of a three-part process to learn something. Mm. So the first part is the input. And so what I talk about and what I teach is, and listening is part of this, is how do you input information in a way that you can hold on to it? that you can grasp it. So first is putting the information into your head. And the second part is how you store it. And I teach kind of a mental filing system where we do this naturally anyway. And it's the way your computer is set up. I mean, this is not something that's a, a foreign idea. People do it, but they do it on automatic pilot. They do it haphazardly. I get people to do it on purpose, deliberately. Mm -hmm. So once you input the information correctly, right. and then once you have it stored in a way that it's retrievable, then the third part of the process is being able to recall it or remember it when we need it. So I, I break down the process and I really show specifically what are the steps in each part of this thing. And I, my approach is what I teach something called natural learning. Mm. I want to get you to use your mind the way God designed it. Oh yeah. You know, the, I want you to be able to do it the way you're built. If you use your mind the way it was designed, it works better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Go face <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I love the, the way you break it down. And, and I love when you said file it, right? And when we think about it, we have the greatest technology ever created the greatest computer and it's that it's between our ears right so we we have three useful instruments right there in the middle we have that computer in the middle 
we have that thing which takes the information in, I mean, on the sides. And then in the middle, we have the one that blurts it all out, right? That puts it out, that, that kind of like puts things together. And then sometimes, sometimes it comes out and it's logical. And then other times, oh my God, it is trash, right? <laughs> Tragic is a, a, Tra a good There's word. A good one. <laughs> is, is a is a good word for these days. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, when when we think, and, and and I love the way you're putting everything together and the concepts that you're using in order to really attain and retain the information, right? Because once we hear it, right, how do we deal with it, right? And did we actually hear it? Or did we hear what we wanted to hear, not the message that was being brought forth? You know, um, I, I like the direction that we're going. This is yeah. a little different than the way some other people have interviewed me. And I, I really like this because you're really getting into something that I think will be tremendously beneficial mm. to your viewers and listeners. So well, let's I, go deep. I, 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 I teach <sighs> a concept that I call X-ray hearing, how to develop mm. super powerful listening skills. And I call it X-ray hearing. You may get a kick out of this uh, because uh, Superman has X-ray vision, gives right. him the ability to see things normal people can't see. Right. Super salespeople, super spouses, mm. super parents, super business people have X-ray hearing and it gives them the ability to hear things that other people completely miss. Now, when I teach this course, I do it in a practical way where I expose what I call the three listening landmines. Mm. There are three things that blow up your ability to be a good listener. And my mechanical approach to doing this is very fundamental. It's very practical. This is not a philosophical thing. Right. So, what I do is I ask questions that are deliberately tricky. Mm. Now, I love teaching salespeople because good salespeople are high ego, high energy people. And so you can't be a good salesperson unless you have a, a high ego. And that's why I love working with, with salespeople. But when I ask these deliberately tricky questions, almost nobody is able to answer them. And then mm. when I tell you what the answers are, it's like a forehead slap where you go, oh, my word, yeah, yeah. I wasn't listening. <laughs> so it, bre it breaks down the resistance where people go, well, I don't know what the guy with the funny mustache is going to tell me. Mm. You know, I'm already good. <laughs> right, right. And so I go through a process where I use different, um, oh, these different listening landmines to, to fool a person. And one of them is what you had talked about before. And that is that people come to a, a, a particular subject with a framework, a point of view already in place. And when you're locked in to your um, preconceived ideas, you may hear the words, but you're not listening. And I make a real distinction. I do, I do a demonstration where I drop coins and mm. I do it behind a, a barrier. Right. And I ask people, I say, well, what did, you know, let's talk about listening. What, what did you hear? And people will say, well, you dropped coins. And I say, great. Tell me how many coins I dropped and which coins I dropped and what was the order of them. Mm. And nobody can do it or very few. They'll right. guess at it. And then I do it again. And now what happens is when I do it the second time, people become aware of the difference between merely hearing and listening. Right. And I talk about the difference between listening for and listening to. So yes, you want to listen to the words that somebody is saying. But if you're in sales or you're in business, you want to be listening for certain uh, clues, for right. certain cues mm -hmm. where uh, you're listening for a potential objection. You're listening for a buying signal. Right, you're right. listening for your kids trying to trick you. <laughs> or, <laughs> and so kids don't the, trick us. Come on. I, I, you know? Mom, can I have the car? No. Okay. Hey, dad, can I have the car? 
Go talk to your mom. I talked to mom. She said to talk to you, right? Yep. <laughs> God, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. Uh, to no, this is perfect because you, you're actually helping put, you know, some icing on on the, on the cake we're baking right. here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, if I may, you know, one of the things that, and when you talked about the coins, it made me think is like, you're right. People are not listening to how many or what different sounds they were, because there are different sounds. And so uh, while you're talking about that, a thought came into my mind. It's like, if I come and I have a wet sponge, I can't absorb anything that you're giving me with that wet sponge. I first have to wring it, don't I? In you know, order to absorb what you're saying. As a martial arts practitioner and as mm -hmm. a, as a, as a uh, an instructor for many years yourself, right. you've probably come across this story where the the disciple was in the presence of the master, and the master asked if he would like a cup of tea. Mm. And with that, the master began to pour the tea into the empty teacup until the cup was completely full and now the tea is running over the top of the cup and all over the tray and the student says to the master but master you you're pouring too much tea that the cup is already full right. and the master turns to the student and says you my son are like that teacup you are already so full of what you think you know there's no room for me to put anything new into you <laughs> that's I love that story. And yes, I've heard it several times. But you know what? When you think about that story, it's it, it's so deep. And, 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 and when we look at how the student perceives things, right? And they want more and more and more and more. Meanwhile, they haven't absorbed what's in front of them to begin with, right? So there's different ways we can look at that story. So thank you for bringing that up. You bet. Hey, yeah. would it be okay with you? I, I came prepared to oh, actually, I actually uh, came prepared to teach something that will, that will, I'm excited. Tr will it's triple cool. your audience's mental powers Oof. immediately. And there's no trickery. We're not going to use any fancy techniques. Do I have to do push-ups, uh, stand on my head? What yeah, do I have to do? Actually, Matt, you do. I, do I, I want to make sure you have the camera tuned to, to show us that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so people that have seen me speak in public, one of the demonstrations that I do is to help grab my audience's attention and to make an undeniably clear point. Okay. I will go around the room and call every member of my audience that I've met by their first and last names mm. from the stage. Wow. And it doesn't matter if there's dozens or 50 or 80 or more, more than 100 people. On YouTube, wow. on my YouTube channel, I have a, uh, a video where it's uh, titled a real or fake. And I recall the first name, last name. Uh, some of the women, uh, their maiden names, if they have pets, if they have kids. And I go around the room and call every single member of the audience by name. And it's just oh a ridiculous gosh. number of people. Uh, now, so do I need pen and paper for the next session? Because I'm ready. No, look at me. Uh, but uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> by the way, me too. Oh, there you go. See, <laughs> you know, one of the things because that for me, w whenever I have an engaging conversation like the one w we are having, it's so many nuggets are coming out from this conversation that I, I take quick, really quick notes. And, and then we'll talk about that to also like, you know, journaling and all that and taking notes and all that. But yes, please continue. I cannot believe that you can recall so many people's names like that. So tell us how. So, so so here's, so when people see me do this mm. and because of the stunts that I'm able to do now, I'm 70 years old. I turned what? 70. This no past way. March. No yeah. way. You look I, amazing. My friend. Oh, well, thank thank you. you. Oh, thank you. My yeah. son. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, yeah, you know, um, I had the wisdom to pick good looking ancestors. That's always a good <laughs> thing. Yeah. You're a smart man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, my, um, when people see me do these stunts, they call me a memory expert. Mm. And 
and yeah, there's, you know, uh, I, I, I do a lot of memory demonstrations. Right. But people love to talk about how do you have a great memory? I, I have a, a video training course on mm. it. I have a couple of my books on the subject. But I like to talk about, and what I want to teach on, are the three causes of forgettery. Mm. What causes you to forget stuff in the first place? Right. See, if you know what the problems are, you're more than halfway to solving it. Yeah. And when you and your, uh, your audience understands the three causes of forgettery, it will immediately triple your mental power. And get this word, effortlessly. Mm. All right, so the first cause of forgettery. People go, well, you know, I'm, I'm losing my keys, my wallet, my eyeglasses. I, I don't remember where I parked my car in a lot. I walk into a room and I don't remember why. I meet somebody and two seconds later, I can't remember their names. Mm. All right. The first cause of forgettery is you don't get it. If you don't get it, you can't keep it. Mm. So let's relate this to remembering somebody's name, for example. So you're at a party. And they and you're at a, a business networking event, and you're being introduced to people, and somebody comes over and says, "Hey, I I'd like you to meet my friend, Mr. Blah blah blah," and you go, "Oh yeah, nice to see you, buddy. How you going?" And if you don't get the name, there's no way you can keep the name. Right. To forget is to not get. Like to forego mm -hmm. is right. to not go. You know, right. oh, I'm going to forego that. I ain't going there. Right. And so the first step is to get the name. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to relate this to something my belated little Italian grandmother taught me years ago. <laughs> my belated little Italian grandmother taught me how to learn anything and everything faster and better and remember it forever. Mm. And she did it in just two words. No now, way. when you can teach somebody something as big and as important as how to learn everything and anything faster and better and remember it forever and do it in just two words. That's really two words that are important. Mm. So here is my belated little Italian grandmother's advice on how to learn anything and everything faster and better and remember it forever. Wow. I'll pay attention. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You've got to pay attention. So you're at the party. And somebody's saying, hey, I'd like you to meet my friend. That's the moment that you need to stop worrying about, hey, where's the food? Where's the booze? Hey, who's that cutie over there? Right. Uh, and that's when you need to, to, to turn, your, turn around and, and get your attention focused and have that tunnel vision and go, okay, I'm going to get a name. Mm. Get the name. All right, so that's the first step. Yeah. The second cause of forgettery is that you don't care. Right. Now, some people say to me, but Matt, I care. Mm -hmm. Well, there's caring, and then there's caring enough to actually do something about it. Let me give you an example. I know many people, and you probably do too, who can quote the names, even the most complicated names, and even all of the detailed statistics on every member of their favorite sports team. Mm. And yet, Forget the, their wedding anniversary or forget their wife's <laughs> <Yes>. birthday. <laughs> and get in trouble for it. <laughs> We're going to go back to that scolding mom or scolding teacher. Right. You can only remember what you want to remember. Right. Guess what? Mom was right. Yeah. If you don't care, you're not going to remember it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people will say to me, and I have young people say this to me a lot, like uh, my daughter is a senior at Florida State University right now. And every now and then. Congratulations. No, thank you. Yeah. Every now and then she will say things to me like, this is boring. And mm. I say, no, sweetie, it's not boring. You are bored. Right. You see, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. The subject is just the subject. You have to bring your attention to it. And so, if, if you don't care about remembering that name or if you're not going to do anything. And so when we talk about caring, you have to care enough to do something about it. It's but like Matt, when can I, can I interject for a second? Let me ask Absolutely. you a question because, and it gives you a chance to have a little coffee. It, 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 
I, I agree a thousand percent. And I, I love the fact that you're taking the lessons from grandma, right? And then she told you, pay attention, you know? So when it comes to your daughter saying, this is boring, there is some truth to what she said. I'm going to tell you why, why I think that. Because I was, I was a above honors student in school, but there were some teachers that were great if you needed to learn to fall asleep. They should have been at everybody's house, wherever, instead of counting sheep, just have that teacher come and teach because they were horrendous. And I like, sometimes I was like, do anybody have toothpicks? I want to try to stay up for this class because I know I need the material. But they were horrible at producing the effects of what they wanted the students to do, which is learn. And then there were other teachers that were beyond incredible and everybody was at the edge of their seat. It's the delivery sometimes of why we're bored and how somebody can pull us in. Now, don't get me wrong, your daughter, if, she, if it was a class, yes, it may be boring, but you have to take interest and go beyond the boredom and look deeper. So I, I agree with you, but isn't it great when we have people who help us to understand things we want, we should learn, but they take the extra effort to make it entertaining. And so you've been called not an entertainer, but an enter trainer, right? My philosophy is to get people to laugh and learn their way to success. That's and that's why people are going to pay attention. And that's why I'm having I'm having a blast, by the way. So Thank you for making my afternoon a great one. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And by the way, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people that do not know how to present information. And mm -hmm. there are topics uh -huh. that are so detailed that it is easy to be bored. Right. But if we put the control as to our level of interest outside of ourselves, mm. then we're losing any level of control that we've got. Right. And so when you were in school and my, like my daughter, or when I was there, yes, I had plenty of boring instructors. So what, if that was a course that I had to pass in right. order to be able to get my degree, so what that it's boring? Mm -hmm. I am bored, so what? I need to find a way to be interested. And so getting back to this idea of caring, there's caring and then there's caring enough to do something about it. And what is it that we're gonna learn to do? we're going to learn to use a filing system. So I've covered two of the three causes of forgettery. Right. But so when you don't get it, you don't care. The third cause of forgettery is the big one. This makes the first two look small by comparison. And that is you don't believe. You know what you don't believe? You don't believe that you have a super powerful computer in your head right now. Hmm. I hear people say things like, Oh, I can always remember a face, but I can never remember a name. Right. Or, oh, I must be getting old. Meantime, they're in their 30s or 40s. <laughs> I'm 70. I'm still doing this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Or, or they and go, oh, vibrant. I'm getting the uh, listen, Alzheimer's. I, I love the energy you're bringing forth because it, it's the outlook that we have on life. And your outlook is bright. So, yeah, I, I love it. And, you know, and you're right. I hear people young 40s 30s i'm too old i recently had somebody in their 20s tell me they're too old and i said to them you're right why don't you lay down and go to sleep and they're like what, what? i said you're telling me you're old so take a nap you know <laughs> or start living and be present right so yeah i i appreciate your vibrancy and and the energy you bring thank you uh it comes natural to me, you know. Yeah, um, I can see that. Um, when God was handing out certain things to people, <sighs> he, he blessed me with the ham bone. Ah, <laughs> yes. I have one of those. And so, um, yeah, I've ever since I was a little kid, uh, real quick aside, my sure. mother, uh, when she was alive, uh, would tell me stories about when I was a baby and she'd be pushing me around in the basket in the seat of the shopping cart in the mm -hmm. in the supermarket and even as a toddler being 
going around the supermarket, I would turn to strangers and go, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I it. it's, I, I'm, it's just the way I'm, I'm wired together. But great getting wiring. back, to, <laughs> <laughs> um, getting back to this idea of belief. Yes, you've got to be careful with the with the self talk, mm. because if you're telling yourself you can't do a thing, then why would you pay? Why would you pay attention? Why would you take the effort to get it? Why would you care? Mm. If you're already beat before your start, why bother? Right, and so. Telling yourself that you have a bad memory and this lack of belief is not the result of a bad memory. It becomes the cause. Now, you can't just turn around and say, oh, I have a perfect memory now. Oh, I'm going to remember everybody. That, that's stupid. That's not going to work either. <laughs> so what do you say when you're meeting people? You, you say two things to yourself. I'm going to remember you. I'm going to remember your name. You say this to yourself or you, you ask yourself if they have a tricky name or a little difficulty, you're going to go, hmm, how am I going to remember this person? How mm. am I going to remember this? By the way, that is a great question to always ask yourself when you're learning new things. How am I going to remember this? Right. And your creativity will begin to come to you to answer that question. How am I going to do this? Rather than saying, oh, this is too hard. I can't do it. Yeah. So. You and everybody that's that's within uh, the sound of our voices, that's paying attention to what we're doing right now, three things. If you get it, if you care, mm. and if you give yourself the right self-talk, you will be stunned as to how your ability to remember and retain and recall vast amounts of information immediately changes. Let me just punctuate this section with a quick story and then we can move on. Oh, absolutely. So I, I like live in love stories, especially when you're telling them, man, you are <laughs> dead on. And man, you know, I, one I of like the you better like, and better. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a whole lot better. Oh, <laughs> we, we will. I think we have a friendship that will last, you know, another hundred years, but, but here's the thing, right? Isn't it interesting how a lot of people think they don't have a story to tell. Meanwhile, they have dozens of stories to tell. So. Absolutely. My, uh, as a young man, when I was growing up, one of my mentors, a fellow by the name of Tom Corbett, taught me everybody has miraculous, amazing stories to tell. Your job as you go through life is to get them to tell those stories to you. And so that those are words that I pay a lot of attention to because I'm fascinated with getting getting people's stories. I learn so much. First of all, I'm entertained, but I learn so much about ways of looking at the world that I never would have considered. Now, I had a story to tell you about somebody that used the three causes of forgettery and immediately improved their business immediately mm -hmm. improve their profits. And so I live here in the Tampa Bay area. Right. And for a number of years, I belonged to a group that was called the Tampa Bay business owners. And there was a professional photographer that was also a member. Mm -hmm. Now this photographer and I, um, we're, we're not friends. We never went out for coffee, but we're friendly and we like each other. Mm -hmm. And so he, would come to me after some of the meetings and ask for a few words of advice. And he had seen me do some of my demonstrations. And so he would get together with me off on the side and I would teach him little things. This, this is one of the top professional photographers in the whole Tampa Bay area. And he was called to do a really high profile wedding out of state. Now weddings were not what his specialty was. He does all sorts of other stuff, but, but he got called to do this high profile wedding. And when he came back and bumped into me again at the Tampa Bay business owners meeting, he said, Matt, Matt, I remembered everybody at the reception's name. <laughs> and so I said, hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> Tell me the story. He said, Matt, I did what you taught me. And 
I not only remembered everybody in the bridal party and everybody in the groom's party, but during the reception, as I'm taking photos, I recalled everybody's name. And I said, and what did that mean to you? He said, well, first of all, I felt super powerful, but they not only paid my full fee right on the spot, but they gave me a bonus that was like one of the biggest bonuses I ever got because I didn't just take photos. Mm. I helped make the event that much better for everybody. That's and beautiful. I, I said to him, let me ask you, you didn't have to use any of the fancy association or connection techniques that I taught you, did you? I'll bet all you did was use the three causes of forgettery, right? And he went, that's right. I just, I paid attention when they gave me the name. I really cared. This was really important to me. And I kept telling myself, I'm going to remember these people. And I did it, Matt. <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful story when you think about it. And before we even went live, you and I were talking about how remembering people's names can actually make you money, right? Boy, that is the truth. You know, being able to remember somebody's name is such an important communication skill that I believe it should be taught the very first day of preschool or kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Okay, children, today's your first day in school. The first lesson is you're going to learn the names of all the other little boys and girls you're in class with. Right. But is that what they do? No. Not at you all. go through your entire life and you've almost never had anybody teach you a system to remember people's names. No wonder you think you're bad at it. Nobody ever showed you how to do it. Mm. It's nobody. Look, this is like riding a bicycle. Nobody's born knowing how to ride a bike, but anybody can do it. Right. Now, not anybody can, can, can ride their bike in the Tour de France and compete internationally in these big bicycle races. Mm -hmm. Right. That's kind of what I do when I remember these huge crowds of people's names. You know, I I took this basic idea to a Tour de France you know, world competition type level. Mm. But I do it to prove a point, because when you see me do that, you can't argue with me whether or not <laughs> this stuff works. So I've got a, I've got a, a, a couple of stories to talk about how True. I used being able to remember people's names to get some big, well-paid contracts. Mm -hmm. So let, let me just tell you one, and then we'll see where, where we're at with time. Let's do it. So For you, I got all the time in the world, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you. Uh -huh. And so um, I want to go back to the early 1980s. I had just left um, a full-time job. And I had be, I, I left that full-time job to become a speaker. And uh, by the way, um, that full-time job is how I got into teaching all this stuff because I, mm. I, I ran a chain of computer programming schools in New Jersey back in the late 70s and early 80s before people had PCs in their home. I'll tell that story in a moment if we have time, how I got started with all this stuff. But I had left that job and I had attended a seminar that was close by to me. Now you're in the New York area. You, you, you probably know where route three in New Jersey is. You come out of the Lincoln tunnel and you go down route three. Mm -hmm. And if you go down far enough, you're going to wind up in the town of Clifton. And so there was a Ramada Inn right there. And there was a seminar that was um, taking place on how to build a successful consulting practice. And I thought that this would be a good thing for me to learn as a brand new professional speaker selling tickets to my weekend memory training seminars. I was one of the last people to arrive in the room and there were maybe 40 other people there and they were all about the same age that I am now. They were all these gray haired people and um, they were executives from AT&T and Bell Labs and Hoffman LaRoche and, and Ford Motor Company and all of these, you know, um, uh, gray haired re uh, retired executives learning to be a consultant. I was late to arrive, I sat in the far corner and the instructor was having everybody in the room stand up one at a time and talk about who they were and what their specialty was. And he handed out a clipboard with a sign-in sheet. And I watched 
the clipboard go down this aisle and up the next and down the next. And then it wound up with me. I was the last person in the row. Mm. And so as these people stood up and talked about who they were, and I had the clipboard with everybody's name, there's about 40 dudes in the room. Right. I don't think there was any women. Right, right. I learned everybody's name. I'm the last person to get called on. Now, I'm in my early 30s. And so I'm the age of their kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. And so I get up and they say, well, you know, who are you? I say, well, 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 my name is Matt DeMeo. And I teach people how to learn things fast. And with that, I can hear the derisive little snickers under their breath, you know, oh, who's this kid, you know, learn things fast. They don't, he doesn't have the degrees I, and the experience I've got. I got shoes older than him. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I said, look, folks, it's probably easier for me to show you than to try and explain it. And I went around the room and called everybody by first name. I hadn't met any of them, mm. but I knew all their names. Not only did I blow their minds, you could hear a pin drop in that room because I just did something that looked impossible. Oh, yeah. How could that be? So mm. I, I stopped all of the derision, all of the snide little comments and people laughing at me under their breath by just remembering everybody in the room's name. Mm. Nobody made fun of me after that. No. And they all went, who the heck is the Martian that just landed <laughs> in the room? All right. Seminar is over. The guy who's running the seminar grabs me before I leave. And he went, young man, the guy who owns my company really needs to meet you. Mm. And so I made a connection, made the appointment, and then drove from my home in New Jersey up to Manchester, New Hampshire to work or to meet the guy who owned this seminar company. And he had speakers that were trained, uh, uh, these contract speakers that were trained to deliver these set presentations all over the country. And I went up to uh, the Achievement Center in Manchester, New Hampshire. Mm. Now, as I'm sitting and talking to this guy, he takes a phone call and discovers that one of his instructors for various reasons, is unable to keep his commitment and do a series of five seminars in upstate New York mm. that were already booked. Now, I'm talking about Buffalo, Schenectady, Rome, Utica, mm. yeah. all the hot spots. <laughs> and this was, this was late November, early December, and the seminars were all scheduled for December. And so he said to me, young man, you've been sitting here telling me how you have the ability to learn things really fast. Well, um, I have a, an instructor that can't keep his commitment and I'm going to be out a bundle of money if I have to cancel 10 seminars because it was five cities, two seminars per city. Mm. I'm going to be out a bundle of money. Yeah. You have three days to learn the scripts and the material from that consulting seminar. And uh, can you do it? And if you can, I'll send you on the road and replace this guy. And so I took a deep breath because this was a, I was taking oh, a yeah. big bite. Uh -huh. So I took a deep breath and I went, I can do it. I took the videos. And anyway, I used all my, my techniques uh, uh, back home in uh, New Jersey and, and learned the material. And my very first stop on this trip was Buffalo, New York in December. Mm. This was now. So, so the first part of the story is I wound up getting this contract with this really high powered consulting firm with this high powered speaking firm as a brand new guy, all because I remembered the names of a bunch of people in a seminar room, um, you know, weeks earlier, right? Second part of the story. So now same experience is happening to me. I'm now the instructor. And I'm on the other side of the derision because now these gray haired people who are expecting to learn how to build a successful consulting practice are coming into this room, the seminar room, and they see me 
an early 30s dude standing in front of the room. And they go, oh, no, what is this kid going to teach me? Right. And so I did the same technique. You know, I had each one of them stand up, tell me about themselves. I had the clipboard. And I said, I can read your thoughts. I know you're all wondering. I'm half your age. <laughs> and you're wondering what in the world can I, a young dude like me teach mm -hmm. all of you with your esteemed backgrounds? I said, I can do something that a lot of people can't do. I teach people how to learn things fast. And you could hear him snickering again. Mm. With that, I take the clipboard, flip it upside down with a, with a flourish, bam. And I go around the room and call everybody by first name, last name, and talk about what their specialties were that they just stood up and talked about. Blew their minds. Not only did I have them eating out of the palm of my hand for the rest of the seminar, Right, right. <laughs> but I had the highest back of the room sales for books and tapes, mm. because when you when you go to these seminars, right. there's front money of attending. You know, they pay a fee, right, and right. then you upsell them to buying books and tapes and take home materials. I had the highest sales in the company. Brand new. My very first, my very first time out with this thing. So I became. Like this, all of a sudden, it's like, who is this guy? <laughs> yes. You know, it, it was like, it was like seeing Van Halen play guitar for the first time. It's like, what? Yeah, yeah. And, and so by recalling the, by having the ability to remember people's names, you, you ingratiate yourself to people. So if you have employees and you know not only their names, but the names of their spouse, the names of their kids, if they have them, the names of their pets, if they talk about them, your employees or your coworkers will have a level of admiration and respect for you that's almost impossible to get any other way. People want to be recognized. They do. They, do. they want you to remember their name. My wife, on her job, had a new boss that showed up. And my wife was doing pretty good on this job. She, she'd only been there a year, but she's been doing better than some of the other employees in the same position as her. And this new manager came in, and he didn't pay my wife hardly any attention at all. And so my wife went up to him because she had just done some things that the top, the top executives were really kind of wowed about. And she went up to this new manager and she said, um, hey, what's my name? And he's now fumbling around. He's looking at the employee roster on his clipboard, process of elimination. He had no idea what her name was. And he, <laughs> he said, my name is Anna. So just think of, you know, the first letter of the alphabet, Anna. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the next time she saw him, she went over to him and she said, what's my name? And he still was flummering around, you yeah. know? <laughs> By the third time, he went, yeah, yeah, I know, Anna. Mm. People want to be remembered. Oh, yeah. And so um, if we have time, I'll, I'll teach some some stuff on, on how right. to do that. But I've got a whole bunch of other oh, yeah, you know, we can talk about. I, By the I, way, you know, I, I have a book on the subject. I, I'm aware. You have three books, right? I do. That you have but this is the one I want to talk about right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things is uh, you definitely have to send me a signed copy. I definitely want to want to get one of your books. But he, here's the thing, right? Everybody, no matter what their name is, loves hearing their name. Right. So that is true. So he, here's the other thing that people do, whether they, they know it or not. Let's say you're in a group and somebody says, let me take a group picture, right? And everybody's like, like this, smiling, whatever they're doing. Now, maybe you forgot that that group picture was taken. All of a sudden, a couple of days come by and somebody goes, oh, look, here's the group picture you, you know, that we took at this event or this thing or this function or this party or whatever. What's the first thing that people look for? Themselves. Yes. Yes. Why? Where am I? Who am I? Where am I? Do I belong? Was I? Did they cut my head off? Right. So the first. Am I smiling? That, Wait a minute. That guy. His 
his face is blocking me. Yes. <laughs> so the first thing that we are always looking for is to hear our name and to see our image. This is why mirrors are so popular, right? <laughs> that's a really that's a really good point. I never yeah. really thought about so, it like that. When, when and you talked about earlier, you know, getting to know thyself, right? The important things of for me, one of the things I tell my clients is do you look at yourself in the mirror, but do you look at yourself in a clean mirror? Because all these mm different things that people are throwing at you is going to dirty your mirror. How often do you clean that mirror? Do you look with honest eyes? Do you? Hmm. Right? What? I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to use that. That's good. It's, it's yours for the taking. <laughs> You're giving us so much, so many nuggets. I'm going to share with you one of the things that definitely kept me very interested and interesting. I was single right after my divorce and I went to an event and it was a singles event and my friend was supposed to go with me and it was raining cats and dogs and there was poodles everywhere. So, the, the thing is that I called him and I'm like, I'm on my way. He's like, oh, it's raining too hard. I'm not going. I'm like, what? You're wimping out? I'm like, I got nothing else to do. It's a Friday night. I'm just going to go. Okay. So I go there. I go into this event. Do you know the Gypsy Kings? I do. Okay. Guess what? They were playing there that night. Wow. Good great yeah, music. In Long Island. So here's the crazy thing. I go in and the place is mobbed mobbed and i'm like wow this place is interesting i walk in and the more i the, the deeper i get in it's only women i'm like this is a a singles night right i'm like okay so i find the lady that i'm supposed to pay my fee to be part of this event so i find her and i say hey how are you and i said i'm here i, I want to give you my money she goes oh i'm, I'm booked i can't take you can I tell you, she almost died, not by my hand. All the women heard her say that, and they said to her, are you crazy? He's one of the three guys that are here, and you're turning him away? Are you nuts? So she's like, okay, okay, give me your money. So there I am, and you know, I talked to some, some people, and, and it was very, very cool, interesting. And at, at the end of the night, comes a by the way you must be extremely popular and you must be extremely handsome because we have this ridiculous uh, people coming up and they're putting spam up here so i gotta block them and uh you know i've been blocking them for a while so see how popular you are so here's the thing right at the end of the night they ask if anybody can speak spanish and guess what i'm colombian so I go, yeah, I can help. And it was to interpret for the Gypsy Kings because they needed to talk to the management and they didn't didn't speak. And this is a restaurant. Usually restaurants have Spanish-speaking people. Not I this had one. no idea that the Gypsy Kings didn't speak English. Right. So there I am and I'm interpreting for the Gypsy Kings and there's no way. So in my, and I'm actually looking at it. I have a CD in my car. That's the Gypsy Kings. And I happen to have been playing it on my way to this restaurant without knowing they were there. Wow. So talk about crazy, right? So I go, oh my gosh. So I get a piece of tape and I have one of the guys, the main guy, the guitarist, play, uh, sign the CD for me. So I have it framed. And it was the craziest and the most fun thing. So I went to a bunch of these events. I never found anybody. But it was fun because it was getting out. You go to dinners and all these things. And the woman's name was Sandra. She she named herself at the end Powers, right? So Sandra Powers. And if she's listening, you know, hopefully she'll realize that she she definitely did some found love and all these things. But I enjoyed the company because it was better than sitting at home. And it was my friend who encouraged me, and he never went to one of the events after that. So one day she notices I'm not really making connections because I just didn't. So I said to her, 
how often do you do these and, and do you have other people? And she goes, yeah. I said, I'd love to host one of these for you. She's like, you would? She goes, yeah. And so she had like three other people that hosted these singles dinners. It was dinners, right? And so I started hosting for her. But the whole thing is, it was called introductions. So I needed to introduce everyone to each other. So I needed to know everybody's name, know about them. So everything you were talking about is exactly what I wound up doing. And people at the end of the night, there's 20, 30, 40 people there. And they're like, Raphael, how on earth are you remembering everybody's name? And I said, because I want to make sure that you guys make the connections and that it is valuable to you. So it was that caring, that interest. And even though I was the host, people still came up to me at the end of the night. Hey, you want to get a drink afterwards? And I was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> because it wasn't, the, the people were amazing. They were beautiful, but I didn't feel a connection. But I was there. And once I found that passion to help people, my gosh, I made some, I made some people um, realize that they were there for a purpose, not because they wanted to sit home alone and I was happy that they came out. And so that introduction actually, some people did get together because of it. But the whole thing was because you would see somebody in the corner by themselves, head down, looking down. And I'm like, didn't you come out to meet people? You need to talk. You need to communicate. So I will go and talk to them for a minute. Tell me a little bit about you. And then I will go to somebody else and go, hey, you know, I, I want to introduce you to somebody. They're really amazing. They're this and that. Oh, really? Who is it? And then I would bring the person over. And the, all of a sudden, they made a connection. But that person, if it wasn't for me interjecting, they probably would have sat by themselves all night and not had that con connection. So Sandra found me as one of her most valuable hosts for these dinner parties. And it was just another way for me to get out of my house and socialize with other people. And guess what? I was getting paid for it. <laughs> right? What a great deal. So I thought I'd share that with you. What a good story. Yeah. Lots of fun. So let's talk about your book. Um, oh, okay. If you twist my arm. Uh, let's go. I twist it again. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. What so, made um, you write the book, first of all? That's my first question to you. All right. So my, I have three books. My first book is called How to Remember People's Names. Mm. Take a wild guess as to what it's about. <laughs> it's on Amazon. Right. And you'll be able to get it either as a Kindle or as a paperback. So I have a, an actual copy of the, the paperback printed out right here. Nice. And so this is uh, one of my three books. Um, my second book is called Forgetful No More. And Forgetful No More is all about the practical aspects of re remembering common everyday items. For example, if you put down your keys, your wallet, your eyeglasses, and then you got to play treasure hunt to try and find them. Or you park your car in the lot and then you fly into a panic because you don't remember where. Mm. Or for business people, you, you, you've worked on that important report and you've got to remember to take it with you to the office or take it home from the office. And you leave and you're halfway to your destination in the car and all of a sudden you remember, oh my goodness, I left it behind. Uh, you walk into a room, you don't remember why, or you're taking an exam. And for those of you that are taking professional exams, we have kids that are taking exams. Yet, yet the answer is on the tip of your tongue and you can't quite get it to come to you. Well, my book, Forgetful No More, addresses all of that type of memory issues. Mm. Because that those techniques are completely different than the, what you would use to remember somebody's name. Right. And so very, very practical stuff. Remembering names is an is a incredibly valuable skill. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you remember people's names, other people will have a level of respect and admiration for you that you just can't get any other way. And it allows you to be w far more persuasive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the key that opens an awful lot of doors. You've heard it a million times in life. Oh, yeah. It's not just what you know, it's Ooh. who you know. You know, and Matt, 
let me, I'm sorry to interject again, but here's the thing, right? Apple is making millions with those tags, right? That you put, they have the little tags that you could put on your phone, you could put on your keys. So in case you lose them, you refine them, right? But here you are, and your book is probably a lot cheaper, <laughs> right? And you don't have to go put tags everywhere. You don't have to put all these things because when you learn the tri the tricks, and I, I don't think you should call, I, I call them tricks and I apologize for that because they're not really tricks, they're skills, right? They're, they, they can be tricks. They, uh, I, I like I, alliteration, so I call them techniques, <laughs> tactics, yes tricks um but yes it becomes a skill mm -hmm. and the, the cool thing is and here's why being forgetful can really hurt you mm -hmm. you know yes yes there's all of the inconvenience part of it and all of all of that side of it let's talk business let's talk m your money mm. when you are viewed as a forgetful person yeah oh he wouldn't remember his head if it wasn't attached right do you think people want to do business with somebody like that? No, there's no trust. It, it breaks their trust. You become unreliable. Right. But somebody that has a memory like a steel trap, you go, that's somebody that knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You become far more persuasive. All right. Let me um, take a break from that. And because I have a third book. That's Wait, really before you different. go there, I, I want to oh. touch upon something Wait, that's very funny, right? Uh, and and I, I, I know you'll appreciate this. So I have a friend of mine, Gina, and she's from high school. And she posts funny things all the time. And anytime she puts up a picture, I always go to check it out. And so we're talking about memory right now. And she put a, a picture up. It was kind of funny. She said, you know, I spent about half hour looking for my phone in my car, but I didn't realize I was using the, you get it? You know what I'm talking about, right? She was on the phone. She was on, using talking to somebody. Flash, no, she was using the flashlight, flashlight to look from around. the phone <laughs> to look for the phone that she forgot. She thought she left in her car. So, I mean, just things like that, that, you know, like you, you have people like, have you seen my glasses? Have you seen my glasses? and it's on their head, right? So it's all these different things. So I, I love the tools and the skills that you're bringing forth with that book. But let's go ahead and go into your third and book. But by the way, solving these problems is so incredibly easy mm. that, and here's what people say to me, uh, when when you go on my YouTube channel and you see the, all of the videos that I've got, one of the most, Frequent comments that I get with all of the different videos that I post is why don't they teach this stuff in schools? Why didn't anybody ever tell me about this before? Mm -hmm. And it's it, a lot of it is common sense. Right. But what I do is I actually break down the mechanics of it. Now, there's something else going on in schools these days that's different from when you and I were young. Mm. And that is online classes. Wait a minute. I got to stop you. What do you mean when we were young? What is that? We are young. Are you in high school or college? Yeah, I just got out. <laughs> so did you, didn't you like last year? Yeah. We are I, I, as young as we want to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go for it. So the, as a result of the uh, pandemic that happened in 2020 when the lockdowns occurred mm -hmm. and we um, and schools suddenly uh, got all closed up and people were stopped from being able to go and congregate with each other. Right. Um, online classes became a necessity and people discovered that they could work from home. They could take, take school at home. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a book to be able to help students and their parents navigate the differences between sitting in a live classroom and attempting to learn things by staring at a computer screen. Right. And it's a really short read. This little book is mm. only 51 pages. Mm. Straight A strategies for successful online learning. 
Nice. And what I, what I deal with in here is not memory techniques. I don't get into any teaching about uh, taking notes or memory, or I don't talk about any of that at all. I talk about what are the practical things that you need to do to be able to get yourself motivated to sit in front of a computer screen to learn? Mm -hmm. What are the differences emotionally that are going to take place so that you can be prepared for them? How do you get yourself organized? How do you take notes differently from a live lecture compared to a pre-recorded lecture compared to a, a broadcast lecture? Mm. There's different processes that you have to go through to be able to absorb the information. See, with a recorded lecture, you can stop it and pause right. it and back up and then and, and do it again. In a live lecture, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be different ways that, uh, and sometimes when you're taking online classes, especially at the college level, those lectures are not recorded. You know, if you, if you don't show up for class, it's just like missing a live class. And so I get into breaking down um, not only that, but also the social aspects. Because when you're in a live classroom, you're picking up the vibes and you're picking up the energy from your fellow students. And there's a feeling of isolation. There's a, people get depressed. Um, mm. People don't know, they don't have the same level of study groups and resources right. that they would have in a live classroom situation. So what I did is I broke down all of the different aspects as I saw it and offered a different perspective on here's what you need to be prepared for. Mm. If you know this is going to happen, remember, it goes back to my idea of if you understand what the problem is, you're more than halfway to solving it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so um, that's what I cover in my successful online learning class. As a matter of fact, I will be turning that into a short online class that people can take and it'll it'll be it'll be cheap like 27 bucks because wow. more and more people are taking classes online and nobody's really shown them what the best procedures are what the best process mm -hmm. is we know what it's like to go to a live classroom what are the differences and what are the uh, what are the strategies that you can employ to become really good at taking classes online and i have I have a lot of adult learners, people that are not just going back to school, but people that have to be certified for different professional uh, licenses. So I've got people that want to get into medical school that take the MCAT that are mm -hmm. students of mine, or that right. take the LSAT to get into law school, or that are in the financial industries that want to take the Series 6 or Series 7 exam. I've got tons of people that are in real estate that need to pass the real estate exam. I've had people come to me that want to learn how to drive a bus or a truck that have to take the CDL, the commercial right. driver's license. And so, um, so I teach, you know, specific um, techniques on taking different kinds of exams. And by the way, I do a lot of that for free really? on my, on my YouTube channel, huh. be Perfect. smarter, faster. That's the name be of your YouTube faster. channel, right? Be smarter, yep. faster, right? Yep. Love it. Love it. When we think about, giving right it seems like you have no problem it seems like you're a giver you you are putting out content not asking for anything in return except for people to remember you right <laughs> i i don't want to get too corny on you but let's do it at, at, at this stage I, of my, my life at this stage of my life my dad was a colonel in the army all right wonderful I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the corny colonel got it. All right. Okay. Go. There you go. <laughs> so, in March, I turned 70 years old. Mm. And when a person. March, March 24th. No. March 24, 1952. 23rd. You're March 23rd? Yeah, that's why we are brothers, man. I'm oh, telling my you. word. <laughs> I'm, I'm born year of the dragon. Hmm. My daughter is also a dragon year. Nice. So how about you? Do you know in Chinese astrological what what, what uh, animal symbol? Yeah, I'm born in the year of Raphael. <laughs> so there, <laughs> the year of the Raphael. That's it. Um, but anyway, so 
at this stage of my life, I am um, really kind of focused on leaving a legacy. Mm. I, I have been well blessed. And I've had the good fortune to have some, some wonderful teachers and some amazing life experiences. And I'm looking at the world the way it is, and I think that I can make a positive contribution. And so I wrote a mission statement, and that is I am on a mission to make a positive, lasting difference to students of all ages around the world. Wow. That's, That's huge. And so with my YouTube channel, I have, I have been driven to my knees in prayers of thanks and feeling humbled mm. with the stuff that people write to me. Um, I, I have people who have names that cannot be spelled with our alphabet mm. write to me really? from every part of the world in places that I will never get to uh -huh. that write to me to tell me what these ideas have meant to them that they've overcome obstacles with their schoolwork or they passed a grade or they mm. got better grades than they expected, or they got into medical school when they never expected to. And I, I think that that was really the first time wow. that it really like hit me like a brick in the head going mm. back a couple of years where I have somebody that wrote to me that said she passed the MCAT. That's the, the uh, entrance exam to get into medical school. Mm -hmm. And she lives in a, another country and passed the MCAT to get into an American medical school, mm. and uh, which is tough for a lot of foreign people to do right. because English is not a first language. Mm -hmm. And she said, what you taught me gave me better understanding of how to study and prepare than even this professional preparation course that I had ta been taking. Mm. And I'm talking about in an eight and a half minute video that you were talking about sponges earlier. Right. And I, and, and I followed up with the story about the teacup. Mm -hmm. The title of my most popular video is called how to absorb textbooks like a sponge. Mm. Um, it has over 7 million views and you know that, and it's, there's no production to it. The sound is terrible. It's a single <laughs> camera shot of me standing against a whiteboard at a public library teaching a group from my church. I, I ran a class called uh, how to remember people's names for my church group, mm. because I thought that that would be a good thing to right. teach members of my church community Of course, because it helps bond people together. And, you know, when everybody knows each other, it's, you know, it's a, it's a more tight knit community. It's like that, so, that, that slogan from uh, the old show cheers where everybody knows your name. Norm. Perfect. <laughs> at, at where everybody knows your name. That's where you want to go. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the song and the movie fame, if you think of the words to the song, you know, remember my name, remember mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, and so at this class in the library, um, a woman who is a colonel at the Air Force base, she's in Natural charge of payroll, time. right? Because uh, I, I live uh, right near McDill Air Force Base, oh, where, CENTCOM, nice. where CENTCOM is located, mm -hmm. uh, Central Command. Gotcha. And she brought her middle school age daughter to one of my classes. And the, the young girl asked a question about um, schoolwork. So rather than continuing to just talk about people's names and, and other memory techniques, I addressed the issue of how do you deal with a textbook differently than the way you read a novel? Mm. And because I record all of my presentations, I videotape all my presentations nice. so that I can go back and look and see, all right, I, I, I hit the mark here. I kind of, um, I, I, I kind of rambled over there, you know, it keeps me, keeps me sharp to continue to evaluate, you know, game footage. Right. Of course. <laughs> and, um, me, right. 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 <laughs> and um, when I was reviewing the video, I had this, nine minute chunk of film that I edited down to eight and a half minutes and I popped it up on YouTube. Now this is going back to 2015. Mm. Now this is before I had a channel. 
or right. an official channel. You know, I had random videos and I just popped it up there. And a year later, almost nobody had seen it. Two years later, it was only a few, few thousand views, two years later. And then all of a sudden, this video, for whatever reason, mm. caught fire. Right. And then over the next two years, really gained some traction. And then it went meteoric. Mm. And I was having 100,000 people a day looking wow. at this video. Wow. And it was like, holy mackerel. Well, so for the first four years, this video did hardly anything. And then suddenly it just went meteoric. Mm. And be, when this video really started to hit, a friend of mine, the guy who owned the Tampa Bay business owners, right. who also does podcasting, is, if you're familiar with PodFest. Yes, or I, Podfest actually Florida, I went to the one in Florida. Well, that's Chris Kremitzos. Yep. Chris is the, was the head of the Tampa Bay business owners. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very friendly with Chris. I know him personally. I know him. I know his daughters. I know his wife. I'm a frequent speaker at his events. I've been a frequent uh, speaker at um, uh, his online pod fest things. Anyway, Chris, uh, at the end of one of his podcasts, uh, something he called the leader cast said, you've got a video with 40,000 views and like 5,000 or 4,000 subscribers. Is your video, uh, are, is your YouTube channel monetized? And I went, what's what? that? <laughs> I, anyway, do you know you can be making money on YouTube? Hmm. I went, really? <laughs> so I went home and I began to research the subject. I'm only talking about two and a half years ago. Right. Maybe, maybe three years ago now. Hmm. Um, and uh, I began to look into the subject and, and I said, I need a catchy name. Because when I talk about, I teach people to learn everything and anything faster and easier and remember it. I mean, that's long. Right. And so I went, how can, what can I say in the shortest amount of words that get the point across? And I went, you know what I teach people to do? I teach people how to be smarter, faster. Mm. And I went, that's pretty catchy. Be smarter, faster. Yeah, perfect. And so I named my YouTube channel that. And came up with some artwork and, you know, it's all homegrown. And I, I used a kind of a, a crappy camera at the beginning and I didn't understand lighting and I didn't. So my early videos, a lot some of my videos on there are like embarrassing for me to go back and watch. But yet people from all over the world are going, oh, my God, you changed my life. It's it's not the, the, the visual. It's the audio, right? It's the content. It's, it's what it's the ideas that I present to people that they go, oh, why didn't anybody ever teach me this stuff before? And so simple things like I talk about how to read faster than ever. Mm -hmm. And I cover wh why people read slowly, why you want to read fast. Th th did you know that if you read faster than you do right now, if you push yourself to read faster, it actually has the opposite effect that people think. People, right. Most people think, if I read too fast, I won't be able to concentrate or focus. No. The opposite happens. The faster you try to read, the more you focus, the better your concentration. Mm. And I explain it this way. If you were on your skateboard or your bicycle and your car, and you're going slow down the road, that gives you time to lollygag and look all around and right. your, your mind wanders. And so you'll get to the bottom of the page and don't remember what you just read. But if you're going down the road on your skateboard or your bike or your roller skates or your car, and you're going really fast, what happens? You're forced to pay more attention to the road. Like what your you, grandma said. Right. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to I wanna talk about one of the things that you talked about, which was legacy. And you said, you know, when you turn 70, you realize that, you know, now you want to leave a great legacy. But we really should not be waiting to a certain age. We can start creating our legacy, even if you're in your 20s. Start now so you have a lot of work behind what you're doing. If you're in your 30s, if you're in your 40s, if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, if you never even thought of it and you're in your 90s and you're listening to this podcast, you can start. Don't wait to start on your legacy. So 
Why is legacy important to you, Matt? Well, think about it. What do you want to be remembered for? Mm. I mean, we're here for only a period of time. Do you want your life to have mattered? Do you, do, and, and, and let me tell you, when I was young, I said, I'm just one little Italian guy from New Jersey. <laughs> what am I going to do? How am I going to impact the world? Right, right. You know, I'm just some guy. Mm. And when you have that attitude, then it's like that belief thing that we were talking about earlier. You're beat before you start. And then as I got older and people would, and see, sometimes you need people outside of yourself mm -hmm. to remind you or to tell you what you meant to them. Oh yeah. And so I was fortunate because in my thirties, I wound up having an opportunity to be on stage in front of some really big audiences. So in my late thirties and early forties, I was traveling extensively. And I was on stage in front of, you know, a, an audience of 500 would have been a very small audience for me. I think my biggest audience um, was like 10,000 people at the Baltimore Convention Center. But I've been on stage at, oh my goodness, a bunch of places in Las Vegas. The old Desert Inn is my, the first place I ever was. But uh, mm. at Caesars Palace, right. uh, the Paris Hotel and Casino. Um, I've been on stage at, at the Waldorf Astoria, at, um, out in, out on uh, Long Island, you know, the, the, the theater that's in the round, mm -hmm. um, uh, the music fair, right. the, uh, Westbury. Uh, yeah, Westbury music fair. That's what, that's what mm -hmm. it is. Right. I think they've changed the name of it since then. Um, I, uh, at the Toronto convention center where they have the, the big sky needle. And so, I've had an opportunity to speak in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people at a time. And like I said before, God blessed me with the ham bone. You can see I'm very animated. I like to, yeah. I like to show off. I like to be entertaining when I talk to people. And I was just being me. You know, I was just being the best me that I could. And then people began coming to me saying, you know, that I made a difference in their life. And I wasn't, I wasn't consciously trying to make a difference in their life. Yes. I thought that what I was teaching, you know, I was really, you know, involved with the te the stuff that I'm teaching is really important. You really need to get this. And they said, when, that's not it. Just you being you, the way you dealt with this stuff, your, your whole approach to it made a difference to me mm. and in, in surprising ways. And that's when I realized that this concept of a legacy was even possible. Right. You want to hear how I got started with all this? Yes. Yes. So your legacy, you mean? No. How okay. I got started with all this, learn stuff faster teaching. Right, right, right. Because it's a weird topic, right? It, I mean, well, you know I mean, what? It's a cool it's topic. It's a weird subject. Because yeah. here's the thing, right? As a, as a person who, if I'm not learning, I am bored. Right. If I'm not learning something new every every day, I must learn something. That's just me. I have to learn. I have to learn. That's it. That's who I am. And your your viewers and your listeners are the same way because just the just the fact that they're tuned in right. to your show is proof of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what what made you get into it even deeper besides your grandma? <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's what happened. The year was 1979. Jimmy Carter was in the White House. The economy was in a shambles. We had lines to buy gasoline. All, oh, you know, uh, that, that, that you were, you were only allowed to buy gas based on the last digit of your license plate on your car. Mm -hmm. You know, we had odd and even days. Correct. And I got into the career training business with a computer school based in Union, New Jersey. Mm. Being in the career training business during economic difficulties is a good move mm. because during those times, lots and lots of people are looking to get retrained for a new career. Mm. When the economy is in the toilet, schools do well. Right. So 
I looked at this school in Union, New Jersey called the School of Data Programming. And I got hired to enroll students. So, so I was like a, a, an admissions counselor. Most, by the way, in 1979, the world had never seen a, a, a personal computer in somebody's home. It didn't exist yet. It would be two years. It would be August of 81. So here we are in August as we're recording this. August of 81, IBM came out with their first personal computer at a whopping 64K of memory. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, I've got photographs bigger than that. Yeah. And so, so a, a few nerds had the Coleco or the Tandy Radio Shack computers, right. but there was no computers regularly available in people's homes. So this whole idea of computers was new, and people were operating on punch cards. These right. these uh, Manila thin cardboard cards that had these rectangular holes punched out of them. So that's the era that I'm talking about. <laughs> Dinosaurs were roaming the earth, and we were on punch cards, and so. My students had a problem, and that is because they were learning to program computers in languages like COBOL and Report Program Generator. Right. It was difficult for them, and my school had a very high dropout rate. Mm. My income was attached to the school being able to collect tuition. And so when somebody dropped out, I got what was called a chargeback on my account. Wow. They, they took money out of my paycheck. I didn't That's like that. Cool. That's not cool. So I was I was financially <laughs> motivated to cure the dropout problem. Mm. Now, the problem was I was a really good student in high school, but I was lazy. I was able to coast through high school, do the minimal amount of work, and be an honor roll student. Mm. When I got to college, I finished two years at Villanova University, and college wasn't like that. No. In college, I actually had to show up to class. <laughs> I actually had to work. And I didn't like that. And so I quit college. I quit to become a, a professional rock and roller. I'm a, a, a keyboard player and I've opened mm -hmm. for many national acts and I've performed under a stage name. Right. And so music was a, a very big thing. So I thought I, I was going to quit school and become a, a, a musician. Well, I tried that for a, a few years and you know that, that, that stuff didn't work out. Anyway, so fast forward to 1979. Here I am at a job at a computer programming school. I couldn't use my own experience as a student to be able to help them. I was a college dropout. Right. So I began to research everything I could to find out what made somebody a good student. Mm. So I was shocked at how much information there was about how do you take good notes? There was no how, information. How, how do you pay attention in class? Everybody tells you you're supposed to. I never took a class on how to do it. Right. Uh, we talked about listening skills. Everybody tells you you got to be a good listener. Yeah. You know, God gave you two ears <laughs> and one mouth. You got to listen twice as much as you talk. Right. Nobody ever taught me how. Right. They just said, do it. Mm. Uh, how do you study for a test? What are strategies to take a multiple choice test? Uh, how do you remember lists of stuff? And I went, I can't believe there's this much stuff that people have, you know, uh, written about it. So I bought every audio tape, attended every seminar. I, I went to, I bought every book I could find. And I began to teach a short 90 minute class mm. called what school never taught you about learning. Nice. And I would teach it twice a semester to the same group of students. Mm. So about two weeks in, I would, I would teach this stuff because two weeks into the class, my students were already going, Oh my goodness. What did I get myself into? I thought this was going to be easier than this. Right. And then I would come back and teach the same stuff about a month before they graduated. Now, mm. not only did I reduce the dropout rate, but I dramatically increased the job placement rate. Because mm. when these young people would go on an interview, they actually knew what they were talking about. <laughs> that oh, made a yeah. huge difference. <laughs> yeah. And that's when the magic happened. Mm. Because I began to get calls from the companies that hired my graduates saying, what in the world are you guys doing at your school? The mm. graduates I'm hiring from your school are performing better on the job than students from competing schools or better than the students that we used to hire from you guys. Right. What's going on? Now, the students had given me the unfortunate nickname of Matt the Memory Man. 
<laughs> now, I thought it was pretty cool at the beginning until I realized that people expected me to be perfect. Oh, oh right. he'll meet you once and he'll remember you forever. No, I right. won't. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm not perfect. I am merely excellent. And so. And getting um, better. Yeah, I'm excellent and getting better all the time. <laughs> yes. But I'm not perfect. No, I've never, you know what? If you ever come across a perfect person, I please call me, text me, wake me up at three in the morning. I want to meet them. Amen. I've never met that person. And I, I, I would love to. So these companies would call and ask what, what we were doing. And the students said, Matt, the memory man at our school. And they went, what, who? And so I began to get calls to speak at professional associations. Mm. So the first one, was a guy by the name of Tony Salinger. Yes, I still remember his name because mm -hmm. the man changed my life. There you go. And he worked for Wakefern Foods, which owns all the shop rights. Mm. And uh, uh, th those of you that are listening or paying attention that are from New Jersey, New York, you probably know about shop right supermarkets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Tony invited me to be a speaker at the DPMA, which was the Data Processing Managers Association. And then I also began to get calls to speak at the ASM, the Association of Systems Managers. Mm. And so professional organizations, these people would meet once a month and would talk about different ideas in the data processing world. And then they would have dinner. And then after dinner, while dessert was being served, they would have a speaker. So in a sense, I was the after dinner entertainment. <laughs> and I would show up and I would do stunts. Mm. So. Now I'm, I'm, we're talking about the early 1980s now. And right. I would show up with uh, 10 copies of the same issue of Newsweek magazine or Time magazine. Now, back in, the, I mean, today it's like a pamphlet. Right. But back then, it was almost it was 200 big, pages yeah. long. Mm -hmm. It was one of the, the most popular magazines in the country at the time. And so I would hand out 10 issues of the same, uh, 10 copies of the same issue. And I'd have people quiz me. They'd go, all right, what's on page 152? Who wrote the article on page 64? Mm. What's the ad right after the page on? And so I would do stunts like that. I would memorize a deck of playing cards. Wow. Then go, what's the 27th card from the top? What's three cards after the jack of hearts? Mm. Then I would teach. I've taught the three causes of forgettery. Right. I would teach some basic list uh, 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 memory stuff. I would teach them how to remember a really long number. One of my signature moves. And to, the way I break through with a lot of people is I get people right on the spot to do something that they think is impossible. So I fill up a, a whiteboard with a string of digits that's, te, uh, that's uh, 10 digits, three rows, 30 digits long, this big number. And I say, I'm going to have you all remember it forwards and backwards from the middle of the two ends. And I'm going to teach you how to do it in less than three minutes. Mm. And everybody laughs. And I always do it. And people are, have their minds blown. I've been teaching. Uh, this has become my signature demonstration. Cool. Um, and at the end of every presentation, I would say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for making me feel so very welcome here. As I call off your name, please stand up. And I'd start in the back corner. I go, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Pete. And I'd go around the room, call everybody by name. Uh, I always got a standing ovation because they were already standing anyway. Because you, and, you, you, you pre-planned it, which absolutely. is brilliant. <laughs> I had, I had, I was Success doing a comes shtick. from planning, doesn't it? I, 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 I had a show. It was the Matt DeMeo show. Yeah. You know, the entertainer <laughs> was born. And so and then I would, I would, I would leverage that and I would sell tickets to a weekend, two day or one day long memory training that I would run at local hotels. Wow. That's and so brilliant. that's how, that's how I got started with this. And then I realized that trying to be a, an independent speaker by myself, mm. booking the gigs, showing up, booking the hotels, yeah, doing the book. I was like, I was real. I loved speaking in front of a group. I didn't like any of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And so I began to apply these techniques to business. Mm. And so I wound up helping companies build large, successful sales forces. You see, selling is the process of transferring information. First, when you hire the salesperson, you've got to get them to learn the product knowledge, learn the presentation, mm -hmm. learn how to handle the objections. There's a lot of learning that goes into hiring a sales force. Oh, yeah. And then managing them. And then 
you've got to have the salespeople that are good enough at delivering the material that the prospect, that the potential customer feels that they learned or understood it well enough that they agree with what they heard enough so that they're willing to cut a check for it. Oh, yeah. So selling is the process of transferring information effectively. That's what I do. Yeah, you do. And you do it so well. You know, I, I got to be honest with you. I not only have had a blast, you know, getting to know you a little bit. I, I think that we need to have many, 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 many more conversations <laughs> so that we can get to know each other a little bit more. But I, I want to thank you for today. It has been a total pleasure. You've brought uh, be. Uh, I can't even tell you your A game, you brought your B game, your C game, your D game, your ev all the way from A to Z. You are definitely delivering. And what the work you're doing and the legacy you're leaving behind is phenomenal. And I'm so happy to call you my friend. But I, I, um, I have to go to another show shortly. So, But I, I wanted to ask you, what's the one word of advice that you can give to everyone before we, we, we turn off? that you can give everyone today that they can start working on their memory? Even more than just your memory. Mm. Everything that I teach, Sifu, takes a little bit of work and effort, but I promise you that it's worth it. Mm. My advice is always remember that the fastest way to get to the top is to get off your bottom. Thanks for having <laughs> me. I love it. That was great. My friend, thank you so much. Let's stay in touch. And you just have an amazing, amazing rest of your day. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.